I guess some of you who are new when you heard it was Bev that was preaching this morning, look for a woman. Well, I'm obviously not. It's really good to see you here, especially if you're visiting. And we're turning back to that, uh, that wonderful scripture that Chris read to us from Isaiah chapter 6 as we talk about the, the, the glory of God. This whole series is going to be a huge challenge to those who preach, and I'm glad I just am preaching one time. I kind of feel that as soon as a human being begins to talk about God, he has to eventually diminish him. Because what language shall we borrow to worship this person that we call God? How can we describe him? What is it that makes God, God? This, this is a hugely difficult subject, uh, and, and we're speaking of someone so vastly superior to us and about whom we only know what he's shown us of himself, um, that we're bound to be very limited in the end. Uh, well, let me apologize up front. I think that's the best way to get it over with. As I talk of God this morning, he is going to be smaller than he really is because I don't know how to talk about him in any other way. That's where we're placed, isn't it? We only know what he has chosen to reveal. One of the greatest men who ever lived, the great apostle Paul, said, there are things that he was shown as he was caught up into heaven and he saw God that he was never allowed to talk about. Imagine living with that. And his prayers and his writings are some of the most sublime commentaries on the person of God that you could ever hope to read and find. This person that we, is unimaginably glorious and, and good and pure and holy and loving. <laughs> there are aspects of this unique person that we can never talk about because there's nothing, there's no parallel in human experience. I mean, we, we use God words all the time in church, don't we? We use the word eternal. Have you ever tried to imagine what eternal is? I remember my, my four or five year old son saying, so dad, what happens then? Uh, we get to heaven and then what? Well, we're going to be with God forever. And then what? <laughs> and then we're going to be with God forever. Okay, and then what? That's the way we live, isn't it? And then what? There's always... And afterwards, there's always something else just around the corner. But God is not like that. He's, he's eternal. I mean, he is, we, we are so time-bound in, in contrast to that. We are finite. As you get older, you have intimations of mortality, right? I was at a funeral just this last week, a family funeral. And there it all was again, showing up. A person who's always been there is no longer there, is gone. And we're reminded of that, aren't we, over and over. We are so finite. And if somebody lives like the Olympic flame runner, well, totterer this week, of 101, was he? Something like that. I mean, we say, fantastic. But you'll read in the paper next year or the year after that he's gone. And here is God, the eternal God, who is eternal, not time-bound. We are changeable, as Chris was saying earlier on. So changeable. In fact, if we don't change, we're rather dull, aren't we? We better learn from experience. We all need to change, don't we? I do. And I'm not just a youngster anymore. And so do you. I hope I'll go on changing to my dying moment and changing more into the likeness of Jesus Christ. Don't you? But he never changes. How is that? Is he a dull God? No, he isn't. But you see, change is either for the worse or for the better. He can't change for the worse. He can't deny himself. He can't change for the better. He is already perfect God. I'm so glad he remains the same, aren't you? This... This God, says David in Psalm 145, his greatness is unsearchable. 
So here's the point. What is the point of straining our brains to try and understand the truth about God whom we shall never fully know? Why, why would we have this series at all? Well, this will become clear as the series progresses, I, I've no doubt, but let's note this in general. Our perception of people, your perception of your children or of your parents, your teachers, your boss, the government, how you perceive them, how you understand them, affects the way you behave towards them. And in a sense, uh, uh, as somebody wrote um, uh, some years ago, for most of us, our God is just too small. We think of him merely as a friend, as, a, as a, someone like us, someone just alongside us for our convenience. Sometimes we give the impression that he's always there for us. Well, he always is. But this God isn't just there for us. He's there for his universe. He's there for all creation. He's there in truth and glory and power. He's there in majesty. He is there in grace. He's bigger than just a friend in our pocket. He's the glorious, omnipotent God. And the more we know about him, the more we will behave correctly and wisely in our relationship to him. Well, let's come to it today. Today, we're thinking about the glory of God as we turn to Isaiah chapter 6. The year 739 was memorable for Isaiah in two respects, 739 BC, nearly 3,000 years ago, one, King Uzziah died. You don't know King Uzziah, neither did I. I had to look him up. King Uzziah uh, has most fame because he's mentioned in Isaiah 6, not because of who he was. Actually, he was quite an interesting character. He became king in Jerusalem when he was just 16 years of age, and he reigned for 52 years. And the Bible generally says about King Isaiah that um, what he did was right in the eyes of the Lord, and so his uh, epitaph was a pretty good one on the whole, but tragically, he ended badly. Actually, when it came to his death, the whole nation mourned him because he was a good king. Two things brought him down. The Bible says, one, the high places were not removed. The people continued to offer sacrifices and burned incense there. In other words, he tolerated hum uh, heathen worship alongside the worship of God. And that brought him down. God was displeased at that. But there was a second thing, and, and we won't go into this in great detail, but this, this was a thing that really, really brought him down. After Isaiah became powerful, says the Bible in 2 Chronicles 26, he became proud. He was unfaithful to the Lord his God and entered the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense. Now, I don't know whether you understand that. Kings of the Old Testament were never allowed to be priests. The two offices were kept apart. Church and state in the Bible were kept apart. But Isaiah, who had grown proud after his 52 years and all the things that he'd accomplished, said, there's one area that I'm not allowed to, to, to take part in, but I'm going to do it anyway because I'm the king. And I'm going to offer incense to God in the temple of God. And he went in to do it, and there were 80 priests who resisted him, brave men. He said, king, you shouldn't be doing this. Keep out. This is not for you, but he wouldn't listen. And in he went. And as he offered incense to God, he was a little like that advert for strokes. Do you remember? The, have you seen it? F fast, is it? Face, arms, speech. Time to call, 999. And those pictures are pretty, pretty compelling, aren't they? There's a fire breaks out on the forehead of the person that you're seeing in the advert. And Isaiah went into the temple of God to offer incense. They didn't see fire, but they saw leprosy break out on his forehead. And the 80 priests stood back from him. They were scared of contagion, of course. And in the end, they drove him out. In fact, he wanted to get out. And for the last 10 years of his reign, he lived in isolation as a leper. And in 739, he died. It was a sad ending to a great life in many ways. That was the year, says Isaiah. I shall always remember that year. That was the year that King Isaiah died. But I shall remember that year for something else much more significant. It was the year in which he said, I saw the Lord. 
as the nation mourned the king's passing. Isaiah went into the temple and had an experience of a king vastly superior to Uzziah, an experience that marked him for life. It was a kind of commissioning experience. It was as a result of this experience that Isaiah became the great prophet that he was. This changed him dramatically, changed him forever. And it qualified him to be among the greatest prophets that ever live. And we still talk about him 3,000 years later. This transforming experience of his life was this. I saw the Lord. I don't know. I, I kind of imagine it like this. That while the nation was mourning, and Isaiah, no doubt himself, who was a blue-blooded man, as far as we can tell, a man of some status and dignity in the nation, as he goes into the temple mourning the passing of the king. He's in a familiar place that he's always been in, in the temple, but in this familiar ex place, he has an experience quite unlike anything he's ever known before. Here, the Lord himself is sitting as king in his temple, very high up, exalted on a throne. The Lord is king where priests serve. And Isaiah sees him that morning in a way that he's never seen him before. And he not only sees the Lord high and lifted up on a throne, he sees angelic creatures surrounding the Lord and the throne. They're called seraphs. It's the only place in the Bible that they're mentioned. And seraphs means burning ones or flames. So here are these burning creatures with wings, six wings. I can imagine sitting there with Isaiah. Well, I, I can only just about imagine it. But here it is. There are these... Uh, the Lord on the throne, high, and all around him, it's like a fire. More flame and wings than faces. And not only does he see that, they're calling to one another. Holy, holy, holy Lord is the, is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. This, this most sacred place is not still, is not silence. It is shaking. Everything's shaking. The doorposts are shaking. The thresholds are shaking. Everything is shaking. And there's wings and sound and fire. And the place is filled with smoke. I have an overall impression of the scene as, as like a great furnace door opening. And there's the fire and the flames. And in... In, in high up is this Lord of glory, but then this fire all around him. It's, it's, a, very, it's a very powerful scene, isn't it? He, and, and here's Isaiah, who'd just gone to church to mourn, who'd just gone to church to worship God, and suddenly he's before the furnace, and it feels as though he's in it, because the whole temple is filled with, with this sound and, and, and filled with smoke. He's before the flaming, fiery, smoky, deafening, purging presence of Almighty God. There he is. And, 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 and the train of this God fills the temple. It's like molten metal flowing down and filling the whole place where Isaiah is worshipping. Holy Holy, holy, say the seraphs, is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. Two, two issues are occupying the, sheriff, the, the, the seraphs, not the sheriffs, the seraphs on this occasion. I was once singing carols in the, in the square in Woolwich one Christmas and suddenly saw the shoulders of people in front of me going up and down like this. And I said, what, what, what's the problem? And they said, you just sang... Thus spake the sheriff. <laughs> Sorry, I get sheriffs and seraphs muddled. Here are the seraphs, these burning ones. Two things occupying them, the holiness of God. God is transcendent. He's up there. He's out there. And with this word, they distinguish God from all other beings, even from flaming angelic beings like themselves. That word holy is like a bag. You can put into it all that makes God God. 
it, it gathers up all the godness of God, this word, holy. God is much more than just bigger and nicer than us. He isn't just the best among equals, is he? He's in a class of his own. He's holy. He's a part. There is no parallel in anyone else. And they repeat, holy, 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 over and over, as though they're trying to penetrate and express the vastness of this reality. The divine trinity is holy, holy, holy. God is transcendent. But then they say something else. The whole earth is full of his glory. Isaiah sees him in the temple, but such a God can't be confined there. He is not only transcendent, he is immanent. He is here. He is in our world. He's in our universe. He's everywhere present. He's that kind of God. He is the creator God. His power and all that he is, his divine nature, his glory, is seen throughout the universe. Holy God, up there, out there, transcendent. The earth full of his glory. He's here with us in this world and universe in which we live. I saw the Lord, says Isaiah. And what I saw and heard changes his life. So God shows himself to Isaiah. He is the great king who sits high and lifted up. In him is no darkness at all. He sits in blinding splendor. He burns like a burning furnace. Our God is a consuming fire. Friends, we need to come to terms with that aspect of God's being, don't we? There's an old hymn that says, Oh, how I fear you, living God, with deepest, tenderest fears, and worship you with trembling hope and penitential tears. We always live with opposites, don't we? We always live with things that are hard to add up when we talk about God. On the one hand, it is as well that we all fear him and walk in the knowledge that one day soon we're going to be before him and answer to him. That never leaves us, even though we're born again Christians, even though we know Jesus Christ, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It's where we begin. But of course, it isn't only that that this man, Isaiah, experiences. In a moment or two, we'll see that he experiences another side of God's glory that takes him completely by surprise. But here is God. There's so much more to his glory than we can tell. By the way, that word glory is an interesting one. The earth is filled with his glory. It's, it's associated in Hebrew with the idea of being heavy. It isn't only that. It's, it's, it's the exact opposite to lightweight. Now, we know what lightweight is, don't we? Superficial, having no substance. But for God, he is glorious. He's heavy with meaning. He's heavy with dignity. Heavy with his kingly awe. Heavy with grace. Heavy with love. There is absolute substance to our God and all his ways. His presence is heavy with worth. His majesty is awe-inspiring. His penetrating purity is overwhelming. He is the sum total of holiness. He is, he is a sea without a shore. He is a sun without a sphere. His time is now and evermore. His place is everywhere. The effect of this revelation on Isaiah, and we move on to that as we close, tells us what it's like to be before God. And if you can hear a human reaction to seeing God, you'll get another aspect of what his glory is like. So what happens with Isaiah? He falls to his knees and he cries, Woe to me! I'm ruined! As the doorposts and thresholds of the temple shake, 
So does Isaiah's life. He has a profound reality check as he sees the Lord. He's made aware of himself and of his world, and he's shocked and overwhelmed, and he reaches this appalling conclusion. I'm utterly unworthy. I'm absolutely ruined. I'm unclean. My mouth is unclean. I belong to a generation that is unclean. And I've seen the Lord. And what unclean man can see the Lord and live? So the effect of seeing the glory of the Lord on Isaiah is that he comes to see himself in a totally different light. That always happens, you know. Catch sight of the glory of God and everything changes. Everything. Everything. The problem with this world is so few see the glory of the Lord. See him and you can't ever view life the same way again. He reaches this appalling conclusion about himself and he, he's come to himself and self-delusion is shown up for what it is. His life that seemed so adequate previously is now shown to be unclean. He's no better than his people. He's profoundly shaken by the revelation of the burning brightness of God. But it's, it's more than that. That presence seems to shine an X-ray beam deep into this man's heart and conscience. And he knows that he's in the presence of someone whose searching eye can scan him through and through. Nothing is hidden. He's open and naked before the eyes of him with whom he has to do. He's finished. But just as it seems as though the story is going to end in utter disaster, something happens that, that he never expected. It comes out of the blue. It's like a surprise, really. That The text doesn't lead you to expect it, but this is what happens. Instead of him being wiped out, he's introduced to another side of God's glory that is even more amazing than his burning presence and his power and his brightness and his shining and all those other things. God does something extraordinary to a man that with a thought would have turned into smoke and disappeared. He sends a flaming angel from the altar to cauterize the lips of his servant Isaiah and to remove his guilt, God shows himself to Isaiah not to destroy him, but to purify him, to humble him, to make him ready for service. And unable to help himself, God provides a way for Isaiah to be clean for his guilt to be taken away and his sin atoned for. And dear friends, this revelation of God as savior and lover of souls, given over 700 years before Jesus came, this revelation of God points to what he'll do when he sends not a seraph, but his own son to be the sacrifice for the sins of the world. It's all pictured here in the experience of Isaiah. Isaiah is one of the foremost prophets, you know, to foretell the coming of Jesus and his work of redemption. You remember that, don't you? Isaiah 53, led like a lamb to the slaughter, sheep before a shear is his dumb, yet he opens not his mouth. All oh, those great affirmations of the coming of Jesus and his death and what that will mean, it comes from the lips of Isaiah. Because Isaiah has experienced the gospel before Jesus came, hasn't he? The one almighty God has done something for this poor, broken man that no one else could do. He sends an angel to bring a coal from off the altar to cauterize his lips, his mouth. His mouth is going to be his main ministry tool. And he must have his mouth clean. And that stands for the whole of his being. By the way, all those who come to God, all those who have any dealings at all with God, will be convinced and convicted about their mouth. <laughs> you know the tool that is the hardest one for us to deal with in our whole body? It's our mouth, isn't it? <laughs> I don't know what it was about Isaiah and his mouth. He lived in a generation of people that said lots of things that weren't true. 
And even when they worshipped God, it was empty and facile. And perhaps Isaiah had some of that in him. But it is his mouth that is clean and cleansed. And the Lord cleanses his mouth. Isaiah is one of the foremost prophets to tell about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Because Jesus Christ is the greatest revelation and expression of the glory of God there's ever be, been and ever will be. I think, I think we have to come to Jesus at the end of our service, don't we? The best way of knowing the glory of God is to look at the Lord Jesus. There's, there's no other place to go. Well, you can look at creation, of course. The whole of creation speaks of the majesty of God. Look at what he's done. And it's quite possible for us to see the glory of... In fact, there is so much of the glory of God in creation, says the Bible, that it leaves us all without excuse. But when we come to Jesus, how is it that John wrote of him, John the Apostle? We have seen his glory, he says. He's writing well after that time when Jesus was here on earth. Maybe 40, 50, 60 years after Jesus was here on earth. John writes, we have seen his glory. The glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. And then there was that man, Paul, who was once Saul, struck down on the road to Damascus by a light above the brightness of the sun, the glory of God and the glory of the risen Lord Jesus Christ. And Christ comes to him. And at that, Paul writes of the Lord Jesus, he is the image of the invisible God. God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, making peace through, the blood, through his blood shed on the cross. Friends, we will know more of what God's glory is the more we know Jesus. The two go hand in hand. All this is why the Holy Spirit came, to make Jesus known to us, and in doing so to make the glory of God known to us. This is how the scriptures put it. The God of creation who said, let light shine out of darkness, has worked a recreated miracle in all those who trust Jesus. So he has made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. Where? In the face of Jesus Christ. So although that glory is beyond our telling, Although, as I get to the end now, I have to apologize for diminishing God. We can know something of his glory, because that's why the Spirit came. To teach us about the glory of God as we focus our attention on his dear son, Jesus Christ. I saw the Lord, says Isaiah. He falls on his knees and says, woe is me, I'm ruined. But it, the story doesn't end there. There's just one last part. He gets to his feet and he says, here am I, send me. The application of that burning coal to his lips is decisive. The pronouncement, your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for, is absolute. Then Isaiah hears the voice of the Lord, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And he responds, here am I, send me. You see, the glory of God, for all it humbles us, it makes us feel how small we are, it, 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 it gives us a correct view of ourselves. In the end, because of his grace in Jesus, it attracts us, it draws us. We want to say, with a God like that, how can I best use my little life? There's no better way than serving him. There's nothing else I want to do but to be in the purposes of a God like that. Do you feel that? No, you don't, do you? Yes, you do. With a God like that, wouldn't you want to serve him all your days? Is there anything else worth doing beside that? Wouldn't you want to devote yourself to him? Some, some talk of Christians as though sometimes they're so heavenly minded they're of no earthly use. You've heard that, haven't you? You don't hear it these days. 
used to be repeated ad nauseum. You know the real problem with us, don't you? Tragically, we're so earthly-minded, we're of no heavenly use. Catch a glimpse of the glory of God in the face of Jesus. And with a God like that, and a sacrifice like that, a death like that, a resurrection like that, a spirit like that, why wouldn't I devote all I have and invest all my little being to the glory of God? There's nothing else worth living for in comparison to that. And far from denying us life as though he sucks life out of us in service of him, he pours life into us so that life goes on growing and the experience of his grace goes on growing. And we land up in places we would never have dreamed of going ourselves and doing things that we could never have done on our own because he is our life and he is our God. The historic record of this great prophet's experience tells us that appreciating the glory of God is life transforming. Catch sight of that glory and the things of earth grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. C.S. Lewis once wrote, I believe in God like I believe in the sun, not because I can see him, but because by him I can see everything else. It's a wonderful, wonderful statement, isn't it? I believe in God like I believe in the sun, not, not because I can see him. Who can watch the sun? But by him, life falls into place. There's order, there's meaning, there's purpose. There's a transforming power in my soul that enables me to live purposefully and die gloriously and invest in the time that is to come, laying up treasure where no moth nor rust can cause it to diminish, where thieves do not break through and steal. For where our treasure is, there our heart will be as well. The journey ahead for Isaiah, friends, was, was a pretty awful one. Tradition has it that uh, he was the one who's referred to in Hebrews as being sawn in two at the end of his day. But Isaiah has seen the Lord. He came to see himself. His guilt was taken away and his sin atoned for, and he responded to the call, and nothing, nothing, nothing will make him turn back. He's seen the promised land. And there's no other land he wants to be in. He's seen the new Jerusalem. And there's no other city that has foundations like that. He's seen the Lord. And it's transformed his life. God grant that we may have something of that in our souls this morning.